a lot to talk about, but before we get started, um, I want to thank Phoenixville Public Library for hosting my talk. I want to thank Mark for handling all of the logistics that go into promoting an event such as this. And I want to thank all of you. You all are busy. You have other engagements and responsibilities to attend to, but you made time to be here. Your willingness to participate in a civic forum represents the best hope for addressing the challenges that I will be discussing tonight. There are three parts to my presentation. I will spend uh, approximately 40 minutes offering some preliminary thoughts and provocations about ideologies of militarism in the 21st century. I will then introduce the newly updated Veterans Empathy Project, which is an oral history project that invites veterans to share their stories uh, with the public. We will then open up the floor for any questions and we can have a conversation. So I want to begin by offering some biographical information about myself. Initially, I was going to justify this segment of my talk by suggesting that uh, this information would make the urgency of my presentation more apparent. Uh, but that is not true. The truth is that I hope that my background will diffuse what is a politically, emotionally, and ideologically charged topic. Tonight, I am going to question the ideology of militarism that has emerged in post-9-11 America. This is difficult to do for we live in a historical moment that does not encourage such questions. Silence is preferred, gratitude expected. As you will see, my background grants me some leeway from the <coughs> cultural prohibitions. It creates a space from which I can speak more freely. I hail from a military family. My great uncle Sonny was a Marine who died in World War II. My grandfather was a Marine during the Korean War. My uncle Bart was a Marine, as was my uncle Gary. My uncle Tom was a Marine, who, after serving in the Corps for 22 years, took his own life. I consider him a casualty of war. My brother was a Marine. My cousin Abe was a Marine, who died fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan in 2010. My dad was in the Navy. His brother was in the Air Force, as are two of my cousins. Growing up, I found this heritage palpable. There was an expectation of military service, and I did not disappoint. One month before graduating from high school in 2000, I joined the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. I chose the Guard because it allowed me to attend college while serving in the military. In 2004, I deployed to Iraq with the United States Army. I was assigned to the Iraq Survey Group, which was a multinational force tasked with locating Saddam Hussein's alleged chemical, nuclear, and biological weapons. Like many young men and women throughout history, my time in a combat zone taught me that war was like nothing I had ever imagined. When I returned home, I looked to literature to make sense of my experience. I received a bachelor degree in English education from Lock Haven University in 2007. That summer, I moved to Bethlehem, took my first teaching job, and enrolled at Cookstown University. In 2011, I received my master's in English. The following year, I was accepted into Lehigh University's English PhD program, where for the past six years, I have had the pleasure and privilege of studying the literature of war and peace. My dissertation, which is the culmination of my time at Lehigh, examines an anti-war literary tradition from the Civil War to the Iraq War that, ch that challenges the evolving idealizations of martial manhood that have persistently convinced generations of young Americans, such as myself, to go to war. Tonight, I would like to focus on one popular post-9-11 martial ritual known as the thank you for your service phenomenon, which is emblematic of a larger ideology of militarism in America today. I realize that that description can be confusing, so let me offer an example of what I mean. Catholicism is a religious ideology that involves many rituals. There is confession, the Eucharist, and the call and response where the priest says, peace be with you, and the congregation responds, and also with you. These rituals provide parishioners a concrete way to practice the ideology of Catholicism. Today, militarism, or what President Dwight D. Eisenhower referred to as the military-industrial complex, militarism is a national secular religion. Thank you for your service phenomenon is one ritual by which civilians practice this ideology. Now, I suspect many of us have personally uttered the phrase, thank you for your service, or heard someone else say it. For anyone who does not know what I am talking about, the thank you for your service phenomenon 
refers to when a civilian approaches a military service member and literally says the phrase, thank you for your service. I imagine that we can all appreciate why individuals might say this to military service personnel. They want to express gratitude for the sacrifices that the military continues to make for us. They want to let the troops know that they are not invisible and they are not forgotten. All of this is commendable. And at the end of my talk, I will revisit the need for civilian support for our military. However, I want to discuss the more nefarious effects of this public expression of patriotic gratitude. I want to suggest that thanking troops for their service can be dangerous. Tonight, I want to entreat all of you to reflect upon this common practice with a more critical eye. This is, of course, a difficult proposition, for it is not immediately apparent how thanking our men and women in uniform can be bad. Such a notion seems disrespectful and grossly out of touch. And yet, perhaps, it is precisely the fact that not thanking our military service members seems abnormal that should give us pause. This feeling of abnormality provides us a point of departure. By way of analogy, in his 1841 essay, America's most famous philosopher, Ralph Waldo Emerson, acknowledged his distress when dealing with charitable organizations that solicit donations. Many of us can likely empathize with Emerson. We've all encountered the Salvation Army bell ringers standing in the cold outside stores. We've all felt pressure to search our pockets for change. At times, many of us have likely avoided the eyes of the volunteer and fled to the safety of our cars without donating money. The subsequent guilt is acute. Other times, we have felt the surge of pleasure and experienced a renewed confidence in our goodness when we hear the tinkle of our generous donations striking the bottom of the red bucket. This is because we all intuitively know that kindness towards others is a virtue. Withholding charity is wrong. The only problem is Emerson reverses the lesson. He admits that it is with great shame that, quote, I sometimes succumb and give the dollar. It is a wicked dollar, which by and by I shall have the manhood to withhold. Upon first reading, Emerson's shame appears bizarre. For how can kindness be bad? How can charity and generosity be wicked? Emerson's point becomes clearer in context. His anecdote is less about charity and more about the social pressures that impose conformity. For Emerson, giving a dollar is to sacrifice individuality and succumb to social expectations. I believe a similar dynamic is at work with the thank you for your service phenomenon. Like charitable donations, there is enormous pressure to participate in this public expression of patriotic gratitude. Not to do so is to abandon our men and women in uniform. It is unpatriotic, un-American. And if it sounds like I'm exaggerating, I would direct your attention to former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick, whom, as I'm sure many of you are aware, President Donald Trump referred to as a son of a bitch for having the audacity to kneel during the playing of the national anthem. As the Kaepernick controversy reveals, many Americans consider it obscene to question popular patriotic rituals of militarism. The opposite is also true. There is, it, it, is, it is easy to thank uh, soldiers for their service. Doing so shows support for the military, which polling reveals to be consistently the most trusted institution in America. More importantly, thanking the troops reaffirms an individual's status as a patriotic American. Just as giving a dollar to charity demonstrates a person's goodness, thanking veterans is a scripted performance that allows participants to proclaim that yes, I am indeed one of the good guys. Or, as Ben Fountain explains it in his 2012 novel, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, civilians, quote, say thank you over and over with growing fervor. They know they're being good when they thank the troops, and their eyes shimmer with love for themselves in this tangible proof of their goodness, end quote. Now, some of you may be wondering why this is cause for concern. You may be thinking, yeah, sure, public demonstrations of patriotism can be superficial. And yes, Emerson is correct, at least on a philosophical level, that participating in these social practices involves uh, sacrificing individuality to the group mentality. But that's life. Every day, all of us negotiate social and personal pressures in order to reach a tentative, unstable arrangement that is both frustrating and acceptable. However, 
I want to suggest that this behavior is extremely detrimental, both to veterans and the nation as a whole. But before we can discuss the dangers of the thank you for your service phenomenon, we need to understand how we ended up where we are. How is it that we all know that we are supposed to thank men and women in military uniform? It is tempting to view our gratitude as natural. Like charity, it is easy to imagine that it has always been this way. But that is not true. During the Revolutionary War, for instance, many citizens were suspicious of George Washington's Continental Army. In his book, Founding Myths, Stories That Hide Our Patriotic Past, and I have to stop here. You're not supposed to judge books by the cover, but that cover's amazing. <laughs> the book is also amazing. In this book, this historian, Ray Raphael, explains that, quote, the very existence of the army was something of an embarrassment to many Americans who opposed standing armies on Republican principles. The decrepit state of this particular assemblage of lower class men and boys was particularly shameful. If anybody had spun the Valley Forge tale back then, they would have been deemed unpatriotic, end quote. The first step to evaluating the thank you for your service phenomenon is therefore to recognize that it has emerged out of the historical moment in which we currently find ourselves. To understand this moment, we must look to the past. In the wake of every war, narratives are created to explain the conflict. Why was it fought? Why was it worth the sacrifice? Why was it lost? For example, as the recent controversy surrounding the removal of Confederate statues in Virginia and Louisiana attest, America continues to debate the Civil War. And 50 years from now, America will still be arguing why we invaded Iraq. These debates, which are invariably colored by individuals' personal beliefs, give rise to false narratives. This is especially true when it comes to controversial wars such as Vietnam. No other war in American history has contributed to the thank you for your service phenomenon as much as the Vietnam War. One of the most popular narratives to emerge out of the Vietnam War is that civilians abandoned our military. This idea was promoted in part by movies like Rambo. Initially, I was gonna show you a clip from this, um, but we're not going to, I don't think we have time, and I'll just describe the scene for you. So if anybody's familiar with Rambo First Blood, um, this is Sylvester Stallone, big role. Um, Rambo comes home, he's uh, suffering from PTSD, he's shocked uh, by his experience, and he's basically harassed by the civilian police, uh, the local police, and he has a breakdown at the very end, and he says that, you know, he did what he had to do to win the war, but somebody uh, wouldn't let him, and that he talks about being accused of being a baby killer and being spit on. So that's the gist of the, uh, the, the, um, the clip that we were going to watch. In the clip, we see many of the familiar elements of the civilian betrayal myth. A traumatized vet returns home and struggles to adjust to civilian life. His frustration and anger is directed not at the Vietnamese people, but at American civilians who spit on him and call him baby killer when he returns home. As Rambo says, he did what he had to do in Vietnam, but someone, namely unpatriotic civilians, wouldn't let him win. For many of us, the scene is very painful to watch, in part because we get to see a veteran who's traumatized by his wartime experience, but also because it forces us to confront a dark chapter in America's history, civilians' egregious mistreatment of returning Vietnam veterans. The problem is that this familiar narrative is a myth. Despite popular belief, America did not lose the Vietnam War because of civilian unrest. We lost because the Vietnamese people beat us. Nor did anti-war protesters spit on returning veterans. Now, I want to offer some clarification because my claim that Vietnam veterans were not spat upon may seem more unfathomable than my suggestion that the thank you for your service phenomenon is dangerous. After all, some of you maybe have been spat upon if you served. You all may have relatives or friends who were spat upon. Many of you have read accounts of this behavior. I personally have spoken with Vietnam veterans who have assured me that they were spat upon. The last time I gave this presentation, there were three Vietnam veterans in the crowd. They were very upset, very agitated, assured me that they were spat upon. So to be clear, I am not suggesting that some veterans in some places in America at some point during the war were, spat, were never spat upon by some people who may or may not sympathize with the anti-war movement. I'm not suggesting that. What I am suggesting is that the image of the spitting anti-war protester, the image that we can all conjure up right now, that image is a fabrication. It's a cultural myth. Now, myths are difficult to disprove, but allow me to place some pressure on the idea that Vietnam veterans were spat upon. 
to do this, I want to acknowledge moments when American military personnel were mistreated. And here I would just point out, I'm not suggesting that Vietnam veterans were treated well when they came home. Right? There was a lot of animosity toward the war, and unfortunately the Vietnam veterans bore the brunt of that frustration by the American public. Right? So I'm not suggesting they weren't mistreated. I'm particularly questioning the spit upon myth. And to do that, I want to just show you some instances when people were actually uh, assaulted. Right? So in his book, uh, Red Summer, Cameron McWhorter discusses the violence that black soldiers experience when they return home after fighting overseas during World War I. Dozens of black soldiers at train stations were attacked, burned alive, and lynched by white mobs who feared that black veterans would assert their rights for equal justice under the law. Lynchings became a way to reassert white dominance. For example, in December of 1918, Private Charles Lewis was honorably discharged from the United States Army. He boarded a train to his home state of Alabama, where that night he was arrested on false charges, taken to jail, and lynched by a mob of 100 people who left his body still in uniform, hanging from a tree as a warning to other black citizens. We know this not through anecdotes or hearsay, but because of documented evidence. This is the front page of the Louisiana Magazine called The True Democrat. And here, so I'm gonna zoom in. Here's an op-ed that I'm gonna zoom into. So the op-ed is right here on the left, and it's called Nip It in the Bud. I realize you can't read this, so I broke it into three separate slides for you to see what it says, and I'll read it as well. Um, so here is the first one. It's worth reading, it's a little bit long, but it's very indicative of uh, what veterans have dealt with. This is from the op-ed. The press reports the taking of a Negro soldier out by a mob and lynching him for a resisting arrest and assaulting an officer. The root of the trouble was that the Negro, thought, the Negro thought that being a soldier, he was not subject to civil authority. The incident is portent of what may be expected in the future as more of the Negro soldiery return to civil life. The conditions of active warfare and the regulations of army life have probably given these men more exalted ideals, ideas of their station in life than really exist. And having these ideas, they will be guilty of many acts of self-assertion, arrogance, and insolence, which will not be born with, in the South at least, and which will be followed by consequences to them more or less painful. Looking ahead, one can see that there will be much friction before they sink back into their old groove and accept the fact that social equality will never be accepted in the South. Right. That's documented evidence of mistreatment. Many dozens of African American veterans who were lynched after World War I. Um, this is a common experience for African Americans. It happened after the Spanish American War in 1898. It happened after the Philippine American War in 1902. And here it happens after World War I as well. Um, what I want to stress here is the important thing is that there's newspaper evidence of it occurring. Okay. Um, fast forward 15 years, and we see another instance of veterans being mistreated. In their book, The Bonus Army, an American Epic, Paul Dixon and Thomas B. Allen document World War I veterans' 1932 march on Washington to demand cash payment for the service certificates they had received after the war. These certificates, which were worth $1.25 for every day of service during World War I, could not be redeemed until 1945. But it was during the Depression, and veterans and their families were desperate for money. More than 40,000 people participated in the march, including women and children. So here is one of the places. It's this tent city. They're also known as Hoovervilles. Um, this is where the families, uh, veterans and their families lived during protest. And here, you begin to get an idea of the sense of the size of this protest. So we see signs here for North Carolina, Tennessee, New Mexico, New York. Um, here we see, again, massive crowds. Uh, here we see uh, a vehicle that says, we won our bonus on our way to Washington, D.C. VFW Post 20, uh, 1289, Chattanooga, Tennessee. So massive protest, uh, veterans from all over the nation coming. Um, long story short, Congress voted down a bill to accept the veterans' certificates of service, and President Hoover ordered the veterans dispersed. On July 28, 1932, police attacked the veterans and their families. Unable to dislodge the protesters, police asked for assistance, and President Hoover called the military into action. General Douglas MacArthur and Major Dwight D. Eisenhower ordered cavalry, infantry, and tanks to, dis to attack the unarmed veterans. Um, so it's a little hard to see. Here are the cavalry. Um, these are the tanks. They don't look like tanks that you would imagine now, but this is again in the 1930s. And we don't see it here, but there's a lot of infantry. They use tear gas on the veterans to disperse them. They also burned down those tent cities that I showed you. 
The results were predictable. Dozens were wounded, and two veterans, Eric Carlson and William J. Hushka, died. Today they are buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Um, you can go visit them. So the immediate question is, where is the evidence that Vietnam veterans were spat upon? Think about it. We have newspaper accounts of veterans being lynched 100 years ago, when we won the centennial this year. Um, we have photographs of World War I veterans being attacked and gassed by police and the military 86 years ago. Why are there no photos of Vietnam veterans being spat upon? After all, the Vietnam War is iconic. There are pictures that we all immediately recognize. Here, for instance, is a famous picture from June 8, 1972, of a young girl named Phan Thi Kim Phu after she was severely burned in a napalm attack. Here is a picture from, uh, taken during the Tet Offensive in 1968. It shows the police chief of Saigon in South Vietnam executing a Viet Cong fighter. You can search this online. There's a video of this, actually. This takes place right before he fires the pistol. In the video, he fires it. The gentleman falls on the ground. He dies, and there's a pool of blood that forms over his head. Right? You can locate those videos with simple Google search. There are also famous pictures of protesters. Here is a famous picture from June 11, 1963, of a Buddhist monk lighting himself on fire in a busy intersection in Saigon to protest the persecution of Buddhists by the South Vietnamese government. Here is a picture of American protesters. This is 1967. Notice they're not spitting. It's known as flower power. It's of an anti-war protester confronting military police outside the Pentagon. So where are the pictures of anti-war protesters spitting on veterans? This is, after all, one of the major stories to come out of the Vietnam War. Where's the evidence? Vietnam was America's first televised war. If, America, if spitting on veterans were such a widespread phenomenon, why don't we have any videos of it? Look, I know a lot of veterans, and to put this into perspective before I mention this, 2.6 million people served in Vietnam. Right? If 1% were spat upon, that's 26,000 veterans. Right? 1%. So I know a lot of veterans. If tens of thousands of young men and women returning from a combat zone were spat upon in airports, where are all the police reports of soldiers and Marines beating up civilians? Where are the medical reports? Where are the pictures of the injuries? Where are the lawsuits? None of that. There's no evidence of that. More importantly, if large numbers of veterans were not spat upon, why do we all think they were? And what are we to make of the Vietnam veterans who claim to be victims of this harassment? To answer the first question, I would direct your attention to Vietnam veteran and Dr. Uh, Jerry Lemke's book, The Spitting Image, Myth, Memory, and the Legacy of Vietnam. Lemke argues that the myth of the spitting anti-war protester was propagated by the Nixon Agnew administration as a way to fracture the left's opposition to the war. According to Lemke, Nixon hoped that, quote, the creation of such reprehensible acts as spitting on veterans would turn the American people and Vietnam veterans against the movement. At that level, the propagation of the spat upon veteran image was simply a propaganda ploy to discredit the anti-war movement. Vietnam War movies such as Tracks, Coming Home, and Rambo further legitimized the myth of the spitting anti-war protester, as did George H.W. Bush administration, which promoted the myth in the build-up to the Gulf War as a way to silence detractors. As for veterans who claim to be spat upon, they are not lying, but they might not be telling the truth either. Memory is complicated. Take the reporter Brian Williams, for example. In 2003, Williams claimed that a Chinook helicopter in front of his helicopter had to execute an emergency landing after being hit by an RPG. Now, an RPG is like a rocket-propelled grenade. It's a rocket launcher, right? So Brian Williams says that the Chinook helicopter in front of his had to execute an emergency landing after it was struck by an RPG round. That's in 2003. Four years later, in 2007, Williams alleged that the RPG had actually been fired at his helicopter, but that it struck the helicopter in front of him. This version of events was later refuted by one of the pilots who explained that his helicopter was 30 minutes ahead of the helicopter that was carrying Williams, so there was no way that Williams had seen a helicopter get struck by an RPG. In 2013, 10 years after Williams first told the story, he changed the narrative once again, this time claiming that it was his helicopter that was hit by the RPG and that had to land immediately. In 2015, these competing narratives caught up with Williams, who was suspended from his job with NBC. He has since apologized for misrepresenting the facts and has returned to television. What are we to make of William's story? He could be lying. 
he might intentionally be manipulating the facts so that he becomes the focus of a close encounter with death. I, of course, have never met Mr. Williams, so I cannot speak to his character, but I don't think he's lying. I suspect instead that after telling the story over and over, each time with minor alterations, each time with more of an emphasis on himself, Williams became convinced that what he said was true. He genuinely remembered something that did not happen. I believe this because, like many of you, I have personally experienced the fallibility of memory. On April 26, 2004, I was stationed at a small base on the outskirts of Baghdad International Airport, located to the west of Iraq's capital city. I distinctly remember that morning, a sergeant named Sherwood Baker approached another sergeant named Benjamin Chamberlain before a mission. Baker asked Chamberlain to mail a letter to his family. Baker made this request because he was rushed for time and feared that he would not be able to make it to the post office on base before it closed that night. During the mission later that day, Baker died when a building exploded and sent shrapnel into the back of his head. I remember this, events, this sequence of events clearly. I believe it happened as much as I believe that I am standing in front of you tonight. I also believe that it may never have occurred. For starters, when I was drafting my presentation, I wrote that Chamberlain's first name was Joshua. I believe this to be true for more than a decade. For anyone familiar with Civil War history, Joshua Chamberlain was in charge of the 20th Maine Regiment, which prevented the Confederates from flanking the Union line at Gettysburg. I only noticed my mistake after multiple readings. The sergeant's first name is Benjamin, not Joshua. I checked government records. In addition, Chamberlain was in second squad. Baker was in first squad. So it would be unlikely for Baker to make such a request. He would ask the men with whom he worked on a daily basis. I am also hypersensitive to how cliched this story is. As someone who spends most of his time reading war literature, watching war movies, writing about war, and speaking to audiences such as yourself about issues of war, I recognize that the elements of the story are all too familiar. We know the story before it begins. A man goes on a mission, gives a fellow soldier a letter to his wife, and dies. Who hasn't heard that war story before? It might very well be the quintessential war story, a perfect mixture of violence and love and sacrifice and camaraderie. So did this actually happen, or did I read about it? I don't know. As Vietnam vet and writer Tim O'Brien explains, in war, you lose your sense of the definite, hence your sense of truth itself. Therefore, it's safe to say that in a true war story, nothing is ever absolutely true. Now, some, as some of you may be aware, director Ken Burns has recently released an 18-hour documentary on the Vietnam War. As part of the promotion for this film, the PBS station in Bethlehem has constructed a digital archive of local veterans of the Vietnam War discussing their experience in Southeast Asia. The project is aptly titled, The War is Still With Us. The same is true of the myth of the spitting anti-war protester, which has become lodged in the national psyche as incontestable truth. That can, this, this kind of incontestable truth that can be periodically evoked as a way to police civilian behavior. For example, a few months ago, I stumbled across an argument about NFL protesters on Facebook. While I didn't participate in the argument, I followed it with great interest. So this is the first post. It says, I'm sorry, but could somebody explain to me how not standing for the national anthem is making a statement? You are only being ungrateful for the country that you are living in. If you don't like it, I'm sure other countries will be happy to hate have you. But wait, you won't leave because those countries won't pay you to have a useless profession, AKA professional football player. As you can see, 62 people liked it, loved it, or found it sad. At some point, another Facebook user defended the player's constitutional right to protest, which caused an argument. Let's see if I can get this to run. So this is the argument. And then this is when someone gets back and forth, and you can see they're going back and forth, likes on both sides, a couple loves. It's a heated debate, and it goes on and on, and it goes on for a little longer, and some more. And we end up here. I'm done. Have a good night. I have to get up at 4 a.m. and go to work. I never win against millennials. 
you have way too much schooling about these things than me. Rather, my 43 years of experience and having a dad who served as a Marine and got spit on when he got home, but hey, he still stands for this country and gets emotional during the anthem. By all means, sit. We could spend the remainder of our time here discussing the implications of this post. Instead, I just want to make two observations. First, the man implicitly links the millennial generation to the unpatriotic anti-war protesters who allegedly spat upon his father. In his mind, not standing for the national anthem is the symbolic equivalent of spitting on troops. The ease with which the man wields the spitting myth as a cudgel to bash his opponent speaks to its versatility, suggesting that each new generation will be denigrated by this caricature. Second, there's a clear disdain for education. The speaker draws the distinction between his opponent's schooling and his own real-world authentic experiences, which include getting up early, going to work, and having a father who served in the military. This makes sense. From the beginning, the spitting myth was designed to override rational thought. Its rhetorical appeal is entirely emotional. Rather than discuss whether we should invade foreign countries, or whether we should get involved in another country's civil war, or whether we should try and impose democracy at the end of a rifle, questions whose importance, by the way, is fairly evident given America's current military debacle in the Middle East. Rather than ask any of those questions, the myth of the spitting anti-war protester changed the parameters of the conversation by creating an imaginary enemy, civilian opposition to war. This is the lesson that this man espouses. This is the lesson that we collectively learned from the Vietnam War. It would be a mistake to dismiss this Facebook exchange as insignificant. Rather, the man's contempt for youthful protesters is emblematic of a militaristic culture in America that demands civilian acquiescence. This expectation of civilian passivity was on full display in Washington last year. On October 17, 2017, President Trump allegedly botched a condolence call to Maisha Johnson, whose husband, Sergeant LaDavid Johnson, was killed in Niger by ISIS operatives. Two days later, on October 19th, Trump's chief of staff and retired Marine Corps General John Kelly defended his boss and attacked Congresswoman Wilson, a friend of the family who publicly criticized Trump. When reporters began to question General Kelly's comments, White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders responded, quote, if you want to go after General Kelly, that's up to you. But I think that if you want to get into a debate with a four-star Marine general, then I think that's something highly inappropriate, end quote. First off, that's just the wrong way the system works, right? Civilians have oversight of the military. We are the ones in control. Um, White House, uh, you know, basically her suggestion that civilians should not question the military was rightly criticized by many in the media. Yet political pundits' outrage appears to have more to do with Sanders' delivery than with the substance of her remarks. After all, two weeks after the 9-11 attacks, then-President George W. Bush offered a similar message, urging Americans to let the adults handle the war. Civilians should, quote, go down to Disney World in Florida, take the family, and enjoy life the way we want it to be enjoyed, end quote. Key operative word there is the way we want it to be enjoyed, not the way that you want it to be enjoyed, the way that we want it to be enjoyed. In other words, as the military prepared to wage what has become America's longest war, civilians were literally told to go on vacation. Bush's advice signaled a new era of war making in America, one where the burdens of conflict are increasingly borne by a small segment of the population, while the rest of the country distracts itself with fairy tale childish amusement. There are two reasons why Americans have, for the most part, agreed to this arrangement. First, we are all suffering from the residual guilt over the alleged mistreatment of Vietnam veterans. We are terrified that we might insult our men and women in uniform. We dread recommitting the imagined sins of our mothers and fathers. Our fear has paralyzed us. It has convinced us that it is best to follow Sarah Huckabee Sanders' advice and not say anything substantial, else we might say something controversial. Instead, we find solace in banal platitudes such as thank you for your service. This arrangement, which evokes feelings of guilt and forgiveness, is quite similar to the Catholic confessional I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. The second reason why we go along with this is because it's easy. There is no overt rationing of resources for the war effort. 
There are no victory gardens. There is no draft. There are no war taxes. First time in American history, by the way, we haven't put war taxes on to pay for a war. And we're fighting multiple wars and cutting taxes multiple times. First time that's ever happened. As the American military wages war against global terrorism, the overwhelming majority of Americans have not been asked to sacrifice anything. On the contrary, civilians' limited exposure to war is actually quite enjoyable. Video games fetishize America's war on terrorism. Recent war movies like Lone Survivor invite audience members to imagine American forces as noble crusaders combating evil in the world. For more than a decade, the Pentagon has paid sports teams tens of millions of dollars to incorporate patriotic celebrations into their programming. Um, war propaganda, that's all it is. The NFL regularly celebrates hometown heroes, and college football often stages surprise reunions between families and returning veterans, much to the delight of adoring fans. Don't worry, if you have not had an opportunity to witness one of these spectacles, you can go home after this talk and spend the rest of your night watching YouTube videos of soldiers returning from war zones to reunite with loved ones. The clips involving veterans surprising their dogs are real tearjerkers. <laughs> I want to end my preliminary comments by explaining why the thank you for your service phenomenon and the militaristic ideology that I have been describing are dangerous. Of immediate concern is how public expressions of gratitude affect military personnel. Many veterans find these exchanges frustratingly superficial. Author and former Green Beret Mike Friedman suggests that thank you for your service can sound a lot like, quote, I haven't thought about any of this. Other veterans believe that the uniform structure of the thank you for your service phenomenon does a disservice to veterans' unique experiences by treating the military as a monolithic unit, commonly referred to as the troops, which can then be wielded as a political weapon. Here is a recent article from The Onion um, titled Veteran Told What Offends Him. The Onion's a satirical website, right? It's meant to be funny, it's meant to be outrageous, it's not real, right? But this is an article and I think it captures what I'm ca talking about. So the article reads, this behavior spits in the face of everything you fought for. Look at that language, by the way, spits in the face, right? Already we're just, this, this is part of who we are in terms of how we start thinking about disrespecting veterans. This behavior spits in the face of everything you fought for, said friends, family members, coworkers, politicians, television pundits, newspaper columnists, and millions of social media users, notifying the 65-year-old who served two terms tours in Vietnam that the protests were a mockery of all the sacrifices he had made. You didn't risk your life so that a bunch of millionaires could grandstand about some social issues? When these players refuse to rise for the anthem, they're trampling all over your legacy. So of course you'd be furious. Upon stating that, the protest saddened him, but that he had fought for their right to take place. The veteran was informed that, while his service was appreciated, he just wasn't getting it. Gotta love the onion. There is also concern that the thank you for your service phenomenon prevents veterans from sharing their stories, which they desperately need to do, both for themselves and for future generations. After all, these expressions of gratitude involve one declarative statement that doesn't invite or warrant a response. Rather than facilitate an exchange of ideas, this scripted ritual prevents dialogue. Iraq war veteran and author of the book Redeployment, Phil Clyde explains that as a result, veterans, quote, can't communicate these very intense experiences it just means that veterans are going to be isolated, and that isolation is a terrible thing to feel. Finally, some veterans are distressed by the disconnect between what occurs in war and these expressions of gratitude. To return to Tim O'Brien, in a 2015 New York Times article titled, Please Don't Thank Me for My Service, O'Brien admitted that he reacts with anger when someone thanks him for his service, for, quote, something in the stomach tumbles. However kind-hearted that thank you is, it's made without much interest in what they're thanking you for, which is killing people. And even if one personally doesn't do it, you're part of something where that's the whole purpose or function of it all." O'Brien's discomfort over the disconnect between the horrific reality of war and the public's perception of war points to the second problem with the thank you for your service phenomenon. It perpetuates war. As historian Gerald Linderman explains, Every war begins as one and becomes two, that watched by civilians and that fought by soldiers. Conceptions initially embraced by society at large retain vitality for civilians long after the experience of the soldier has rendered them remote or even false. The divergence of outlooks leads inevitably to tension." End quote. 
the thank you for your service phenomenon is both a result of this division and a desperate attempt to mask its existence. Rather than question what a veteran's military service entails or how it might run counter to our national ideals and our national security, blindly thanking a veteran for his or her service refuses to take a side in the debate. Instead, it reimagines war in non-controversial, implicitly patriotic terms, insisting that while war may be bad, every soldier is good, every soldier is heroic, every soldier's service is worthy of adoration, every soldier is thanked. This apolitical approach to war commemoration betrays America's civic responsibility. The bedrock of democracy is a well-informed citizenry. By precluding conversations or directing conversations into familiar, superficial expressions of gratitude, the thank you for your service phenomenon hinders civilians' ability to educate themselves about America's current conflicts. It prevents Americans from gaining the information necessary to exert pressure on politicians in order to ensure that the wars that we ask our young men and women to fight are worth the loss in treasure and blood. Civilians' absenteeism is unfortunately part of a broader trend. Congress continues to forfeit its constitutional obligation by outsourcing war oversight to the executive branch. The War Powers Act of 1973 requires Congress to approve or disapprove the use of military force after the first 60 days of any given conflict. In February 2015, President Obama asked Congress to exercise their constitutional authority and debate the merits of the war against ISIS. The Congress refused. Instead, they continued to rely upon a 17-year-old authorization that dealt with Al-Qaeda, not ISIS. Recently, Representative Barbara Lee of California introduced an amendment that would require Congress to debate the war against ISIS. On June 29, 2017, Lee's amendment passed the House Appropriations Committee with bipartisan support and was attached to the House Department of Defense Appropriations Bill. Speaker of the House Paul Ryan unilaterally removed the amendment from the final version of the bill, thereby preventing Congress from holding a vote. In the Senate, Rand Paul refused to allow his chamber's version of the defense authorization bill to proceed until a vote occurred that would open up the topic for war authorization for debate. The motion was rejected with both Pennsylvania Senators Bob Casey and Pat Toomey voting against it. Meanwhile, the Trump administration refuses to provide the public with any information about U.S. military involvement in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Libya, Somalia, and Niger. They have offered no timetables for troop withdrawal. They have not revealed how many additional troops will be deployed, and they have presented no concrete goals by which to measure military success. Instead, it is reported that Trump has deferred decision-making to Secretary of Defense Mattis. What we have is thus a series of abdications. Civilians defer to Congress, who defers to the President, who defers to the military. The end result is the military is overseeing the military, an arrangement that our founding fathers greatly feared. What initially appears to be an innocuous expression of patriotism is therefore actually a crucial component for ensuring militarism and perpetual war in the 21st century. In this way, the thank you for your service phenomenon, like Emerson's dollar, is a wicked practice that we all need to resist if we hope to support our troops. Thank you. So that's my introductory remarks, and I just want to show you a website. I'm not going to talk long about it because um, I would like to hear from you. Um, here's contact information. I'll put that back up in a second if you're interested in. Uh, the contact information would be, one, if any of you locate visual evidence of Vietnam veterans being spat upon, I would love that information. You could send it to me. I'm by no means suggesting that I'm absolutely right on this. Um, I'm just trying to provoke us to have a conversation. I haven't seen any evidence that's persuasive or that's convincing. But again, if you talk to Vietnam veterans, they are adamant that this happened to them. And, you know, who am I to tell them that what their war experience was like, right? So I'm just trying to look for more information. So I'm kind of crowdsourcing my research. Um, so by all means, if you can locate videos or something, I would love that. Um, in addition, if you could, um, if you know anybody who might be, um, oh wait, I can't see it up there. Let me try to, oh, there we go. I'll put my information back up in a second. I just wanted to show you this. This is a project that I work on. This is the Veterans Empathy Project. And what I do is I interview veterans. Um, and I brought, I wasn't 
the, the project existed before I got on board. There were approximately nine veterans. We now have interviewed 17 veterans, and there are a few more that have been interviewed that haven't been uploaded to the website, and there's a few more interviews scheduled for the future. And what we do is we interview veterans, ask about their upbringing, ask why they joined the military, ask what their experience was like in the military, and ask how transitioning back to civilian life, if they're out of the military, how that's going for them. And the idea is it's going to be a few things. One, you know, the thank you for your service phenomenon, one of the reasons why I don't like it, for instance, is it just totally doesn't pay attention to the, the individuals involved in the military, right? And this is an opportunity to show, like, no, actually, these are the people, the young men and women who are fighting our wars, right? They have hopes and desires like all of us, they have fears, right, they have families, and this is trying to humanize kind of combatants so they don't just become an abstract kind of body. Um, that's one goal. The other goal is just to provide veterans an opportunity to share their stories. I think a lot of people, the military was a great experience for them, and then they leave the military and they don't get to talk about it anymore, and it's such an instrumental part of their life, so we wanted to provide an opportunity for veterans to share their stories. Um, this is a searchable database, so a couple of schools in the Lehigh Valley are now included in their curriculum. Um, so students are able to listen to veterans' uh, oral history, right, out of their own words, kind of explain their war experience. It's very valuable, both in terms of like a research, but also in case like high school students maybe are contemplating the military, to hear like, well, what did the veterans themselves think about the military? And there's no political agenda here. Um, there are veterans on here who had a wonderful experience in the military and think it's the best thing that ever happened to them. There are veterans on here that are very critical of the military experience. Um, so if any of you know any veterans that might be interested in sharing their story, I have flyers up here and I'll put my email address up in a second. But anyway, that's what I uh, wanted to share. Yeah. Well, um, as far as thanking veterans, I'm trying to see it the way you say this. I'm also seeing it as very patronizing to them. And also, in the back of their mind, they're saying, oh, boy, I'm glad it's you there and not me having to fight the next war. Thank you. What's that? The last part? I'm glad it's you there and not me having to fight that next war. The civilian thinking that. Yeah. Right, yeah. It's very patronizing. No, I agree. And again, I don't think people mean that, but I think that often comes off it's that way. in the back of the head. Yeah, um, for sure. I think that's right. And I mentioned that book, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, and that's something that he gets at. I mean, Ben Fountain really captures what this is. There's something, like a, we fetishize the, the, the violence, and, and people kind of admire this. Um, I have my office mate who was just having dinner with his brother, and his brother said, like, you know, if there was a draft, would you go? And my office mate was like, no, probably not. And he's like, I would. And it's like, well, what is that? Like, you can go join the military right now. Like, you don't have to wait for a draft. If you were, like, very patriotic and gung-ho, like, you can, they're looking for bodies at the moment, right? So it seems a little... Superficial, yeah. Well, also, I think the government's been behind this all the time. Look at all the war things that children have been exposed to cartoons, movies, videos, games, weapons to play with. And it just prompts them to be ready to go fight a war. Well, yeah, we have a military empire, it's, right? It's and perpetual. The military empire, in, all, in order to sustain that, you have to persuade young men and women to go fight children. for wars that. Children. Yeah, children. But it has to happen at a young age. And, um, and again, it's hard for me to say that because the military paid for me to go to college, right? My dissertation's on the military. You're all here listening to me because about the military, so it's been really good for me. That's and yet it's also hair. very hard for me, so there's an ambivalence, right? That's the red herring that gets you. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. But I agree, you know, we have to convince, and this is all part of it, right? Standing for the national anthem, right? That is part of the ideology. Oh, Most of us would think this is weird, by the way, if we were at Walmart. Oh. And like a bell went off and we all had to turn to the flag, stop pushing the car, put our hand over. <laughs> the flag came down, the national anthem went out, F-16s flew overhead, military soldiers marched by us. But that's what the NFL is. It's a private organization. It's a private company that is then participating in the propagation of propaganda. Oh. But like that makes no sense. Most of us would be baffled if that happened at Walmart. Well, yeah. I thought that the players were protesting police action, not military action. Yeah, they are. That's true, it's, but... It's police treatment of them. And I don't understand it because it seems to me they all deserve what they get, but it's like they're on their knees, not against the anthem, but against a, um, a theory or a, I can't put a word to it, a, a feeling that they have. Yeah, no, it's been used to smear them, right? It's kind of the, 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 the narrative that you're talking about that they're against the military. It's just been an effort to delegitimize them. To um, the police. Right, right. Um, and the protest is very peaceful. I mean, really the protest. Yeah, but that's sick. I can't imagine. Yeah. I mean, the pressure to have the public support the troops or individuals of my interpretation is the, the soldiers are the pawns who wittingly, unwittingly, willingly, unwillingly participate in these wars, undeclared. And it, 
the whole idea of the propaganda is if you don't approve that, you don't approve the wars. If you do support the soldiers and imply in that, as you're approving all the wars that we're involved with. Mm -hmm. that, to me, that's part of the whole, you know, the whole plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think at the beginning, you mentioned about the, the, the poor soldiers that we said at the beginning, uh, about soldiers that we enlist in the military are typically socioeconomically impoverished, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we call this a poverty draft in the military, right? There's no formal draft, but it's poor people that join the military. That's why yeah, I joined. My family just sent me to college, so they sent me to college, and that's, they got me to do that. And I'm really grateful for them, but that's the reality of it. Those are the people who fight our wars. So how do we show respect and thanks to military? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, for me, um, no, just instead of saying like maybe like you know thank you for your service, maybe like hey you want to tell me about your service. I mean that sounds like cliche too, but like actually treating people like they're humans. It would be like me coming up to you and saying like um, like like I don't know you're a woman. Thanks for being like mother and just presuming all these things on you right projecting all of these beliefs on you that you one you have children two that you like having children right all these different things right but I'm just immediately projecting a caricature onto you uh, and, and that's associated with all of these kind of um, um, abstractions or qualities right that I'm imagining that you possess because you happen to be a woman right that's the same thing I think a lot of veterans feel it's like in no other profession do we really do that like, we don't look at doctors who wear their stuff and say like thank you for being a doctor but for some reason like if veterans have military uniform on it's like they no longer have their own subject. They're there for our entertainment, right? They're there for us to go up and talk to them, right? Maybe they don't want to talk to you, right? So I just think, for me, I mean, Ben Fountain says, give a soldier a hundred bucks. Um, he said, at least they'll get money. Um, it's better than just an empty kind of rhetoric. But I think, um, you know, I think talking to soldiers, when you get an opportunity, it's kind of hard. I, don't, I want to just go up to a soldier and talk to them out of nowhere, um, if you don't know them. But I think asking them, like, yeah, how was the military? Why'd you join? What'd you do? What was your job? You know, did you like it? Like other questions that allow a conversation to occur, right? And I don't know, you have to kind of judge that, you know, in the content or the context of how it's happening, right? And you, you'd be a better judge of that than I would necessarily. But I think, you know, genuinely engaging them as real people as opposed to just uttering something at them and then leaving, right? Um, so that's how I would recommend it. Asking how we could help them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely a good idea. Um, and I think the key would be giving them an opportunity to talk. Right? I think like me doing these town hall talks, this kind of event, it's good for me for my own work experience. Right? It helps me kind of express this. I wouldn't be able to do this five years ago. Right? It's therapeutic for me to come and talk to all of you and have a conversation. I think veterans want to talk I and mean, they want to share their experience. I think those experiences are, are hard, but I think unfortunately we don't really provide many outlets for that to occur. Right? And instead we tell veterans what their experience was, like you're a hero. Right, or you did this, or like this was it was bad over there, right? And we just presume all of these things, and it's just not fair. Um, when you say veterans, what wars are you talking about? I used to term wars. Yeah. Started with Vietnam. Well, this is the tricky thing. A lot of my talk here, again, um, I think the Vietnam veterans who have been frustrated with this talk, uh, who have been animated by it, right? I, I love the conversation I've had with them, but I get their position, right? It's like, oh, here's a young guy who's read a few books who wants to come and tell me about their war experience, right? And I don't want to presume to do that, even though I'm doing that to some extent. I'm just looking for evidence. Um, you know, their experience is different than my experience. And quite frankly, I left the military, I was in Iraq in 2004, but the stuff that's happening there is radically different than my experience. So someone who joined, who fought over there in 2008, right? I have a friend that I interviewed for this project who, who was uh, fighting ISIS in 2015. His wartime experience was radically different than my wartime experience, right? I got there, it was like 2004, like the war was building up. So we had anything we wanted, right? We had great food, we had, um, like all the weapons we needed, all the ammunition. He's there at a time when we're kind of downgrading in, the, in Iraq, so he doesn't have the resources that he needs to struggle, right? Um, and he's working much more with like the indigenous population, and he's, you know, it's scary to do because you're worried about kind of infiltration and if you're gonna get attacked. Um, so it's, it's hard, I think, you know, just trying to keep an open mind about who we're talking about, because, yeah, every veteran's experience is different, every war is different, and yet there's always these common, these common commonalities between those wars. Um, so, um, I just think being responsive and being flexible. Um, again, which is the thank you for your service doesn't do that, right? The thank you for your service phenomenon, right? Like people say it to Vietnam vets, they say it to World War II vets, they say it to Iraq vets, they say it to Afghanistan vets, and that's just not really a one size fits all kind of thing. I think that's intellectually lazy. Well, I think the government's trying to say thank you now by making veterans' health more available, health care, mm -hmm. and probably sending them off to school, maybe they 
Yeah, yeah. You know, it's one of the tragedies of this war is that... In back, they have nothing. Yeah, you know, um, unfortunately, um, Dick Cheney said that the war was going to be over in a few weeks and that we were going to be greeted as liberators. So they didn't put any preparation in terms of, you know, hundreds of thousands of veterans coming home with severe psychological and emotional damage issues from what, you know, they saw or what they, you know, did or what they didn't do. But right? they just didn't have the resources for that. There was a massive shortage at the VA. So they're trying to get up to speed. But that process, unfortunately, you know who bears the brunt of that is that's the veteran themselves. The, the man or woman who suffers and can't get the help that they need. Um, yeah? Okay. Well, a couple of things. Uh, one is, uh, I don't entirely buy your thing about the, the spitting, um, because um, uh, just photographically or whatever, um, you know, it's such an unworn and personal and momentary kind of thing that captured on camera would be harder than things which build up and have a certain sequence, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it did become a meme, which way outgrew whatever may have have happened, right. but I mean, it is a really excellent point. Um, I was also wondering, um, well, I really like what that one guy said, uh, you said he said, um, it's a, another way of saying I haven't really thought about this, you know? Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that the whole thing is one of many rituals that, many rituals that what they really add up to is, um, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Um, so, because people who experience in one form or another, like the darker aspects of humanity, darker experience of humanity has, you know, um, they know something other people have experienced, don't know, you know, and other people don't want to know it. They don't want to know, mm -hmm. you know, and it's dangerous to know. It's dangerous to your personal life to know, you know. So there's this quarantining that happens, and then PTSD is a product not only of the experience that was had, but the quarantining off of the person. You know, mm -hmm. They can't talk. Mm -hmm. No one wants to know, mm -hmm. you know, which is why peer groups are so important. Yeah. It's a, I, I just think it's a terrific thing you're doing because you're in this position where people can't just say, oh, you don't know anything, you, you did serve, you mm -hmm. know. But I just I just wonder what you think um, is the most effective uh, thing that, that can be done to educate civilians about war uh, and be, you know, kind of the most effectively subversive thing you can do against this kind of jingoism, this kind of, you know, militaristic, you know, what do you, what, I mean, what you're doing is, I think, great. But mm -hmm. I mean, do you have, what's your idea of what's most effective? Yeah, yeah, a few things. Um, just to, before I answer, I have to go back to your point about like trying to shield the populace from what they don't want to know, right? Kara Hoffman writes about this. Um, her brother was in the military. She's written books about this in her Times articles. And she says, the label hero, we use the label hero to silence veterans because heroes don't have issues, right? Heroes don't suffer, right? So when we project that onto veterans, we basically are forcing them to be silent, right? We are censoring them. Um, and she calls that out, right? And says, we need to stop that kind of rhetoric. Um, and I agree with you with the spitting thing. It is such a, a, an emotive kind of response. It's really hard to imagine hard capturing to get that on. But I absolutely think you're right on that. And I think um, whether or not the spitting actually occurred, I think we all suffer from the guilt of that, which feeds into this notion of like, let's never insult veterans ever again, which I would rather be insulted than treated like, like a one-dimensional character. Um, in terms of what to do, I think events like this having conversations, I think trying to find outlets for veterans to talk, um, I think resisting the allure of militarism, right? There's always these blockbuster movies that come out and it looks sexy, you know? It looks great. There's people in there fighting and there's like, you know, I think of like Lone Survivor or The Hurt Locker or American Sniper. I mean, all of these participate in this fantasy and it's immensely dangerous, right? It's really dangerous, um, not only for like the young men and women, but I think like you talk about the children someone mentioned, right? Is like I go and give talks at middle schools and like those kids are really excited about the military, right? They know all the weapons better than I do. They know the nomenclatures. They are very gung ho about the military, which is really scary to me. So I think, um, you know, resisting that kind of allure, both in your daily life, but I think in conversations with other people, right? I think there's a temptation that there's an association that the military gets to have the sole claim on patriotism. And if you criticize the military, somehow you're unpatriotic. And I think we need to break that dynamic. Right? That's not the truth, right? I mean, everybody has their version of patriotism. We shouldn't let other people define our patriotism, right? Because, I, I, you know, I, I was one of the, I don't know what percentage of Americans who actively protested the Iraq war. And I was, afterwards, I think a lot of us just felt so ineffectual. Like, it was so ignored. And even though people all over the world were actually protesting, it was just like, it was like, so ineffective. So mm -hmm. ineffective. And I, that always stuck with me. And, and you mentioned movies. Um, I, that's my other question: is um, which movies and um, and books do you feel like have really been the best for you for providing insight? Like, 
I haven't seen or read that much about that kind of thing, but I do remember one of our own by Willa Cather, mm. which oh, was yeah. really insightful. Yeah. And then also Hexall made really it's funny because I never watched any movie with the slightest bit of violence because I can't I can't even see one tiny bit of violence. But for some reason I watched Hacksaw Ridge, maybe because they gave me free cable channel for a while. And I was I became obsessed with this movie and I watched like every little bit of all the horrible violence I had never even watched. Like I can't even watch I, I don't know, I can't explain it, but I became obsessed with that movie. So a comment you have on either one of those I would love. I mean, yeah, what was the first movie again? Uh, well, that was a, it was a story. Oh, one of ours, you said. One of, one, one of ours, yeah, yeah. Bill and Cather. And I just found that really insightful about yeah. why young men will go to war. And, and then the other was just, I just became obsessed with Axel Ridge. Yeah, that's amazing. I don't know anybody else who's read one of ours, uh, Willa Cather's book. She won the Pulitzer for that, right? But, yeah, Pulitzer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a really great book. You write for, I think, is it Clyde, who is so bored at work? Or he has like a farm the life, farm he's bored, boys. and he wants to go experience he has the glory. ideals, and he, he's not satisfied. Yeah, the yeah. Life. It was just, it was really good. You know? For me, um, in terms of fiction, I, I mentioned Ben Fountain's 2012 book, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. That really captures the kind of NFL patriotism of like using veterans as props. Um, I like that a lot. I also really enjoy um, Tim O'Brien, of course. I think he's just an iconic figure. Um, and, uh, and I think one thing that Tim O'Brien says at one point is like, we were cowards, that's why we went to war. Right? We, were too cow we were too cowardly to resist going to war. And I think even that kind of changing the language we use to think about how we go to war, right, that it's not a heroic thing necessarily, right? It's in some ways, it can be cowardly. Um, and greedy. And, and, yeah. And I think the other one for me is um, Stephen Crane. Um, I really like Stephen Crane. I read on Stephen Crane. The Red Badge of Courage is such a, fun, a fundamental text. And I like that one because um, I had a friend who sent me boxes of books when I was an Iraq a professor. And it, they just helped me process my experience. And Red Badge of Courage, Henry Fleming, it has a lot of guilt at the end of the book because of the things he's done in war or the things that he hasn't done. And I thought that helped me reflect on my own kind of guilt that I feel. Um, so you mentioned PTSD, which I think, of course, is a very significant thing. There's also a thing called moral injury. I don't know if you've heard of this. Um, and I would self-diagnose myself with that. A moral injury is basically the guilt that you feel about actions you took or actions you didn't take. Right? We all have these moments where we kind of pick up, you know, criticize ourselves in our heads about the things that we didn't do and the things that we did do. Um, you know, and I think I have those moments from both specific moments in the war, but also in the general participation in the Iraq war. Um, I worked for the Iraq survey group, which again was looking for the chemical, nuclear, and biological weapons. Um, Saddam Hussein didn't have those. Right? So the cause of why I went to the war was not true. That's a hard thing, right? That's not like Pearl Harbor, where like suddenly you can imagine the narrative of why young men went and fought, right? But for me, six months into my deployment, to recognize that the cause why I'm there was a lie, right? It's just a lie. Um, and we could talk about that. It's more complicated, but in my mind, that's what it is. That caused me profound guilt um, to participate in that kind of thing and to do what we did to the Iraqi people um, and what is continuing to happen to the Iraqi people. Um, so I've read some books on that um, that have helped me process that kind of stuff, but those are the immediate ones that come to mind. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm trying to think now, if people did spit on the soldiers, what would be the cause? And you think back to Vietnam where the soldiers had to shoot women and children because they didn't know who the enemy was. Mm -hmm. And they figure women are carrying guns too. Mm -hmm. So then it comes back and the, the protesters of the war use that to, to denigrate the soldier. Mm -hmm. You're so bad. And the soldier says, but I had to do it. Right. Now, there could have been some spitting on soldiers back then, but I don't see it today. No, I think you're right. And this was hap this happened, right? Certainly, like, certain things like My Life Massacre was used to denigrate the entire war effort. Right. And again, there's lots of books on this. You can see if it's how isolated of an incident was this or how emblematic was it of a larger policy of attacking civilian populations. I worked for a lawyer who was in the, in the Army, I think it was, and he was a lawyer and he said, damn it, I had to defend those damn people. Meaning he had to defend the guys who committed the Mi'ai mm -hmm. massacre. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He hated that, yeah. but he had to do it. Yeah. And that's why I was trying to stress earlier when I said that they weren't spit upon, like, right? I think, like, again, I don't ever want to diminish that, that, that they weren't greeted as heroes when they got home, right? That's an absolute truth, right? They came home and, again, America well, was divided on that war and took it out. Women and children not thinking why they had Sure, sure. And that goes back to I quoted the Gerald Linderman, who's a historian that says, war begins as one of it comes to, that fought by civilians, or that fought by soldiers and that watched by civilians. That, that occurred in Vietnam, is there were realities of war that the civilian population didn't know or couldn't understand. Uh, and that creates that tension that he's talking about. So yeah, I don't want to ever diminish what that, that felt like or what that experience was like for our Vietnam vets. I just think that we need to be careful not to fall into the narrative of that the civilian opposition to war is the thing, the lesson to be learned. 
Um, I think civilians have a, a, an obligation to be uh, against war and to pressure our government to try not to fight. Yeah. I have friends who are veterans of the Korean War. Mm -hmm. Smart people, good guys, but I don't think they realize the neocons at heart. They just believe that the, the U.S. wears a white hat and has worn a white hat all the time. And, the, and all the other countries that don't bow down to us are threats by definition. Yeah. And uh, so I get the emails from the show and pictures of the latest warship or the latest plane that we've made and so on and so on. And I've expressed my opinion not to them, but and they know how I feel. But they're still friends, but to, to say these kind of comments to some of the other people are totally uninformed. It's absolutely, I mean, the right people, I know, PhDs, yeah. good education. They're so, I've lost relationships yeah. because of uh, enlightening. It was such a shock yeah. to hear anything like that. It's just totally incomprehensible. Yeah. And so the, the public is generally really uninformed. Mm -hmm. In the dark, mm -hmm. and I don't know what it's going to take to uh, you know to win the, get the public informed. Yeah, unfortunately, um, you know, I think what you're describing is so common is because, as I said, we have a military empire, and that requires a, a military ideology to justify that. And ideology is kind of imperceptible. It's hard to pierce ideology. It doesn't matter how educated you are. If you believe something, it's just really hard to, to kind of rip that out by its root, right? And I think, unfortunately, that's only going to amplify as we can move toward more drone warfare, right? Because now we're using, we have lots of wars right now going on with drone warfare that are not authorized by Congress, but Americans don't have to deal with it because we don't see caskets coming home, we don't see body counts. Um, so it's going to be increasingly easier for us to get more and more distant from the horrors of war. And we'll use terms like smart weapons to imagine that we can sanitize war and that war is clean and, and precise. And since <laughs> Americans don't actually experience it, since we don't see it on the television too much, It'll be hard to break that. Um, unfortunately, you know, I, I, I don't have the answer on that. I mean, I always love to hear from all of you, but I think um, I, I'm doing my part in terms of trying to write articles on this and trying to speak to people. Um, but it's hard, and I have, fa I have family members who wouldn't like this talk that I gave, right? And, you know, so it's not like you know everybody that, that I'm, I don't know that I interact with is enlightened and they're all on my side. Right? That this is a controversial issue, and it's politically and emotionally charged, and that divides people, and, uh, you know, my family included, um, you know, I don't know if I answered your question at all, but yeah, I, I sympathize with what you're saying. Yeah. Any thoughts at all on Syria? <clears throat> yeah, um, so, unfortunately, um, we don't have an authorization for the use of military force, which we, we were required by the War Powers Act of 1973 that was put in place after we knew Vietnam to prevent executive overreach, to make sure that we're not going on cavalier military expeditions. Um, that hasn't worked out that well for us. Um, so Congress refuses to do that, to authorize use of military force. Um, they need to do that to put parameters on the mission and to clarify the troops' mission, because the military can't win wars if they don't know what the goal is, right? And none of us know what the goal is, right? At least they're not communicating that well with the American public. And that's both President Obama and now President Trump, right? That's just kind of a quagmire there. Um, I'm also very skeptical of this notion of like, well, there's atrocities going on there, there are atrocities going on there, and therefore we have an obligation to get involved. I mean, in some ways, serious, I don't want to make them sound like they haven't participated, that they're not, that they have agency too. But we also contributed to the destabilization of the region, right? So we kind of are somewhat to blame for that. And the notion of we can keep justifying war as like cleaning up our, our mess, I kind of think of this like if I wanted a new car, my wife said, like, I don't want a new car. And I was like, okay. And then she left. And the next day, I drove my car into a tree. Right? And said, like, well, we've got to get a new car. Right? What's done is done. She loves me. She would accept that. But if I did it again and again and again and again, eventually she would recognize that she's in a toxic relationship. And I think our relationship with the military is toxic in terms of <laughs> it is a continual war. It's a perpetual war. After Syria, it will be another place. It will be another country that we want to dispose, you know, change to mimic our, our, our style and what we approve of. So I'm very skeptical of using, um, sending in the military, um, especially without any kind of authorization. Like uh, President Obama proposed in 2015 a three-year window to say like, here we can fight ISIS. After three years, we'll need to renew that and have another debate. 
I would be more sympathetic if we did something like that. But the notion right now we're using the 2001 AUMF, right? Those individuals aren't even in Congress anymore, right? I mean, some of them are, but the majority are not. And that's still being used to justify fighting anywhere we want in the world. Yeah, I was surprised that you said uh, Senator Casey actually voted against that one amendment that would have forced um, that's, I, mean, I love Casey, so I yeah. didn't hear anything bad about him, but that's surprising. Yeah, he voted recently for the bill that um, Senator Lee and Bernie Sanders have about making, um, forcing us to have an authorization for the Yemen war. Right? We're supporting Saudi Arabia in Yemen, right? And again, we're saying well, that doesn't count as a war because we're not actually on troops on the ground, but we're doing fueling their planes for them and stuff like oh, that. Glad he did that. Um, so he voted against that. So you know, I don't know why his justification. Oh, he voted is. against. No, he voted. He voted for right. the, the yeah. recent bill. It didn't pass. But um, I don't know. He might have a reason to justify why he voted against that. Yeah. And that's you know, I think. Well, I, I call my congressmen and senators every day about this issue. They get really annoyed with me, but um, I just think that's one of our obligations. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. This was great.